we get started here, I want to remind you about uh, next Tuesday, the 7th, is the Mighty Macho Men of Matoka meeting. We're to be here at the church at 6, and it'll be uh, Tyler Swibothian's farewell party, send-off. He's getting married uh, next month, and so we're happy for him. Or sad for us, but maybe they'll come to their senses and come back to God's country. And also, <clears throat> we have our car show coming up, so we just want to remind you that. Be thinking about what you might can do to help us out in that area. Okay? So we're going to get right into this study. Looks like a lot of people are camping, and I pray for them. We are in this study, it came from Hebrews chapter 1, where the writer of Hebrews is making an um, argument that Jesus is better than um, the prophets, and he's better than the angels, he's better than Moses, he's just better, better, better. And it comes uh, as an argument to the Hebrews to prove to them that Jesus is God. And so that's a tough thing for the Hebrews to accept. And um, so we have tried to teach the truth and um, expose some things about angels that maybe you did not know. So um, there are different uh, pecking orders or different created beings. There's not just angels. There are cherubs is the highest order that we can find in the Bible. And the Bible says that Satan was the anointed cherub. So he was a special cherub, and he was a created being. And then you have one mention of, of a group. It could be a blending of cherubs that's called seraphim. Now, we're going to touch on them in a little bit, but not tonight. It's kind of a... Uh, it's kind of a real unique thing about the seraphim. but And then, then you have archangels who seem to be in the angel class, but they are the uh, authorities or the leaders in that class. And then you have just the angelic host. So I want to ask you something. <coughs> uh, how many of you in here always believed and thought that Satan was a fallen angel. Don't ever raise your hand. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. The reason why I do that, I, I want you to think about it. That's how easy it is to be deceived. Now, the greatest thing, I believe, is, and it's going to sound weird to you at first, the greatest thing that will help you in your Bible study to get further in the Lord is to come to the realization that you are easily deceived. And so I always say this. I, every time I am studying something or every time I go to read the Bible, I read it with skepticism, not of the Word, but of my ability to interpret it. So I always second guess what I think is an interpretation, and then I always want to uh, sure that interpretation up with other scripture because I'm afraid of myself that I'll, um, because of my uh, influences or my where I live or, or what I've been taught, that I might skew the truth. And so if you come to it that way, it'll keep you down the path of truth. Now, if you, if you don't, if you, if you just do not think you could be deceived, then you're right for the pickings, okay? So the Bible says of itself that the Holy Spirit will interpret it to you. So it's not just like reading the morning paper. It's a spiritual event. And if you... We, uh, some of us Sunday, made a commitment to read our Bibles 30 minutes for 30 days. If you will do that um, and understand it's, it's a spiritual moment, uh, I'm telling you, it will change the way that the book opens up to you. 
So I was thinking about this week, this that this week. That's one of the things that happened in my life when I discovered that I'd been taught wrong my whole life. So go with me for a second with my hypothesis. If if there's one guy that has some uh, deception in what he believes and teaches, but he's teaching a whole bunch of people. And if those whole bunch of people, primarily 95% of them, just take what he says to be the gospel, and they don't really have any spiritual um, learning on their own, they just go and parrot what he taught them. Let's say he teaches uh, in a seminary, maybe he teaches 10,000 young preachers in his life. Now you've got 10,000 of these people that are promoting this deception that he, and, and it may have been innocent. He may not have had nefarious uh, purposes, but now you've got 10,000 of them promoting this falsehood. Well, they're teaching other people. Now you see how it just explodes. And so um, when you come across something like that, don't, don't be embarrassed by it. Just remember that that's very easily done. In, in the purest of motives, you can be deceived real easily. So the Bible says that the truth of the word is understood line upon line, precept upon precept. A line would be a line in the Bible. A precept would be an ideal or a thought. Here a little bit, there a little bit. So you put together the truths of the Bible with the whole Bible. Notice, I don't want to point this out like Captain Obvious, but there is no chapter that you can go to to read about faith. There is no chapter that you can go to to read about the sovereignty of God or the love of God or the any Bible topic you want. It's not categorized that way. The truths of God are mixed into it, are married into it, like when you put uh, a cake batter together and you crack an egg and put in it, the egg's in every piece of it. Well, that's the greatest way to decode a Bible or to make it to where someone can't just take out a chapter that has all the truths in it and destroy it or hide it from you or whatever. The truths of God are in the Bible, line upon line, here a little bit, there a little bit, precept upon precept. So that's, that's uh, the perfect way to, to uh, get the truth out there. I just want you to understand, if you've believed that like I did forever and ever and ever, you were categorically deceived. So look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 through 15, and we're going to start tonight and, and look at this thing. He's talking about false apostles already in the church. This is around 55, 58 or something A.D. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Okay? They are not the apostles of Christ, but they want you to think they are, okay? And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Watch this. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed. So he's calling these false prophets Satan's ministers. Do you get that? His ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. So I want to ask you something. Where was the devil transformed into an angel? Much less an angel of light. And when? When was he transformed? Paul talks about it in the past tense. Where and when? Well, I think mainly he's talking about in the garden. 
in the garden, Satan transformed himself into an angel of light. And we've had this study on the angels for two, ser- for two uh, meetings, and I can't go back and teach the same thing over and over and over every time, but when the Bible says that there was a serpent in the garden, I believe he, Lucifer or Satan, was transformed into an angel of light. There, it wasn't a snake. He's called a serpent. He's called the serpent all through the Bible. Metaphorically, he is uh, embodied with different symbols of a serpent. Is he a serpent? He's got something to do with a serpent. But I don't think it was a snake talking to Eve. I think it was a very, very handsome, if not the most handsome man that's ever walked, talking to her. When angels manifest on the earth, They manifest as men. They are not men. They transform themselves into men. They look like men. They walk like men. They talk like men. That's what they manifest on the earth. But that's not their spiritual bodies. See, you have a spirit, and you have a spirit body. It does not look like your fleshly body. And the Apostle Paul said, when we are in heaven, we will be in a spiritual body. Your loved ones that are in heaven right now are in a body. It has fingers, eyes, memory, tongue, it talks, it it listens, but it's not a fleshly body. When you are joined at the resurrection with your glorified body, it will be a fleshly body. Jesus said, handle me and see when he came into the upper room. He said, I'm not a ghost or a spirit like you assume. Handle me. I'm in a glorified body. I am flesh and bone, he said. But there is no blood. But just like Lucifer, for example, or Satan, in the spirit world, he looks... Ezekiel 28 gave you the description of him. Cherubs have four faces. Primarily, their head is an ox. They have legs and feet of an ox. They have wings with man's hands underneath them. They have the torso or the body of a man. But when he comes to earth, he manifests as a man. He looks like a man. I I want to, I hope you get that. So look at Ezekiel 28, 14. Now, we're going somewhere tonight. Just hang on. Thou art the anointed cherub that covered, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Those are the stones of fire in front of the, uh, the throne of God. Thou wast perfect in thy ways in the day thou wast created till sin was found in thee. So he's created so we go back to this verse, Genesis 3.14, and we pick up a nugget. Genesis 3.14 said, And the Lord God said unto the serpent. Now this is a reference to Satan. But he's on the earth. Do angels manifest themselves as eagles when they come to the earth? No. Do they manifest themselves as anteaters, uh, koala bears? They ain't koala bears cute. Our friend from uh, Australia said they're just drunk little boogers. He said they're always drunk on eucalyptus leaves. I don't know. That's what he said. But angels, when they manifest in the flesh on the earth, they manifest as men. But he's called a serpent. Don't let that trip you up. That happens all through the Bible. Don't let it deceive you, though. Watch it. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle. Well, right there ought to tell you something. Serpents are in the serpent kind. Cattle are in the cattle kind. And we know from last studies, cherubs represent, they have a man, a face of a man, a face of an eagle, a face of a lion, and a face of an ox. But there's this one that was Satan, 
that we think may have somehow represented the rep the reptile kind and the aquatic kind. It seems funny that those two uh, categories of God's creation aren't represented in the other four cherubs. But God says to him, you're cursed above all cattle. Now, what you got to put here a little bit, there a little bit, the other scriptures are, the primary face or the head of a cherub is an ox. And its legs and feet are ox. Does that put it in the cattle kind? Well, so I just think it's odd that all over the earth, on every continent, in every people group, in every society, civilized and non-civilized, they have always worshipped the bull. Let me show you. Show my first one, Kenny. Now this is an old ancient carving. It's in a museum in Egypt. Now I want you to notice something. I mean, you guys are the Wednesday nighters, right? What do you see? Huh? A cobra in front of a sun disk. That pan looking thing is to represent the sun on top of a bull. So on this carving, now if you've been coming to Sunday school, you know that uh, Exodus 12, 12 says the God that they worship, they're not gods at all. They're demons. They're devils. All the plagues that God chose in Egypt to bring the slaves out, he just picked on their major gods. They're, they had other gods. They had a whole bunch of other gods. But I think it's ironic, and I want you to let this soak in on you. This, you just read a verse where he said, you old serpent, you're, I'm going to curse you worse than all the cattle. Well, there you go. You've got a cobra on top of a bull. Now, if that was the only one, that, that would be really telling. That would be something strange. Now, remember what I always say. Now, you don't have to believe this, you know. But every person is led and guided and inspired by spirits. Ask yourself, why did the Egyptians worship the crazy things they worshipped? Why would human beings worship animals think I mean you just think about it I know most people don't think about this stuff I do I lay away at night thinking about it the Egyptians worship the dung beetle now that was whoever started that was a heck of a preacher to convince a whole bunch of people to worship a bug that rolls around poop because it, it was so masterful way that it rolled it backwards and all this other stuff. But I can show you in the Bible, we taught it here before, um, there was an army coming against uh, the, the uh, oh, the, what do you call it, Philistines, were coming against God's people, and God wanted to destroy them. So what did God do? He didn't do some big great thing, you know. He just gave them all hemorrhoids. Well, you ain't, much of a warrior if you have a hemorrhoid. So what did they do? They started worshiping hemorrhoids. They had their people, their craftsmen, that carved the idols to carve a, a hemorrhoid to set on the fireplace mantle so they could worship it. And they sold them. Human beings are the most deceivable ignoramuses on the planet and we would all be in that class in that class if we didn't have the spirit of god within us and the book so the egyptians they just worshiped thousands of gods and ultimately worse than the dung beetle was probably they worshiped the man as god 
But you say, people aren't that stupid to do that today. Well, all the Catholics worship the Pope. You know, they've done a masterful job. Most Christians don't think that Catholics worship the Pope. You ought to read their literature. I searched and searched till I found that old video I had, and I put it on Facebook. And people are just amazed out of their own mouths. Well, I didn't know that. I didn't believe that. Well, why didn't you know that? So we'll believe just about anything except the truth. Have you ever noticed that? People will believe the most unbelievable, far-out thing, but not the truth. So show me my next picture, Kenny. I, I can't stay here this long. Now, this is a bull, but this isn't in Egypt. You can't see it very well because the picture's old, but that's a man standing there with a Indian turban on his head. This is a giant thing, but this is in India. This is in Egypt. Show my next one, Kenny. Here's an Egyptian drawing. That's a bull's head on a man with scales. Now, if I had a mic, I'd just drop it. I'm telling you, the anointed cherub that covers... I don't have all the pieces because they're not in here. But the clues are here. He has something to do with the reptilian race and the aquatic race. Show my next one. Here you go. That's a bull's head. That's a sunburst. And that is a cobra. That's a staff. That's an onk cross. All that stuff's devilish. That's scales on his belly. Well, I didn't show you because I've showed you a thousand times. Go look at the drawing of the goat of Baphomet and see if you don't see it all. Next picture. Here's a... Oh, you are. Which one are we doing? Okay, here's a depiction of the calf that the Israelis worshipped once uh, Moses went up on the hill to get the, the directions and the uh, Ten Commandments from God. That's Aaron and his brother leading the worship. They're blowing the horns. We don't know if that's what it looked like. But how did these people know how to make a calf? Well, the Bible is real clear, and most people miss it because nobody teaches it. The Bible tells you over and over and over. There's this ideal that the little Egyptians, I mean the little Israelis, were just little be, you know, beat down, brow beaten little slaves, and they was crying out to God, Oh, God, help us. Oh, God. Oh, Yahweh, the one true. No, they weren't. They were worshiping the gods of Egypt. They were putting their kids in the furnace. They were drinking their kids' blood. They were offering their kids' blood to the hierarchy in Egypt, and they were burning their bodies as a sacrifice to the gods of Egypt. They did not believe in God, and God covered them anyway. Next picture. Here's an artist's rendition. And what he's trying to do, he's got New York City in the background. What he's trying to do is to portray to me the ideal they're worshiping the bull. Now, when we get there in Sunday school, and if you're not coming to Sunday school, you need to ask yourself, why in the world ain't not coming to Sunday school? When he comes down, Moses comes down, Aaron says, these people, man, I don't know what I'm going to do with them. They took off their earrings and their bracelets and that gold that the Egyptians gave us, and we just put it in a fire, and out come this calf. Well, God makes him the high priest, and he's a big, fat liar, and everybody knows it. He, I can show you time after time after time, God should have just struck him dead. But God covered him. How many times has he covered you? So you got to get this. They was worshiping the calf. 
buck naked, dancing to music. And it wasn't a hymn. So when Moses gets down there, he's got these two tablets that God wrote with his finger, and he etched them from within and without. Have you ever seen those things you can buy at the truck stop that they've laser etched, you know? These are emerald stones. You could see through them, and he put the law in there. And Moses gets down there, and he throws them down, and it shatters. Now, when Moses came down, he came down with those tablets that God wrote and the blueprints to build the tabernacle eventually and the, um, I mean, the tabernacle and the temple eventually. God gave him the blueprints. He throws them down, and he tells the Levites, which were his family, he said, put your swords on and go hunt down every one of those 3,000 people that were naked here worshiping this calf and kill them. And then he went back up on the mountain, and God said, okay, big boy, sit down. I wrote them for you the first time. I'm not writing them for you again. Now, some of you parents could take a real good parenting tip here. He says, you broke them. I'll dictate them to you. You're going to chisel them out with a hammer and chisel. That's a fact. Next picture. Well, guess what that is? Well, we don't worship a bull, though, do we? It's everywhere. Now, I want you just to sit there, try not to go to sleep, and just think, what's the odds of every nation, every continent, every village? Can you not see that some has inspired people for 6,000 years? They're sitting around with a bone in their nose. Hum chakalaka. And the thought comes to them, we need to worship a bull. In India, they're so deceived, they'll starve to death before they eat one. Now, it's not. It's everywhere, people. Next picture. Now, this is all through the Bible. I could have started at, at 6 o'clock and just read the scriptures about Moloch, and we wouldn't have got done at 7. This is so prevalent. And what this was, Moloch, was this big metal erected idol. It was a bull. It had man's hands, though. They know from ancient writings and drawings that Moloch had a bull's head. It had metal arms and hands. They would drain the blood out of their babies and drink it and sell it. And then they'd put the lifeless body in the hands. The hands were on a pulley system. And the weight of the baby infant, the hands would fall and drop the baby in the fire, and then the hands would come up to receive another baby. Well, let's see the next picture. This is probably a better description of it. Now, these are Israelis. You say, the children of God did this? Yes, they did. Over and over and over, not just one time. They didn't learn from their lessons. And that is probably the high priest signifies putting a baby in there. Do I have another picture? Oh, wait, go back, Kenny. That's the same picture, but go back. I got to show you something. Look over here to the right. They got some drums. Over there to the left, they got horns. If you don't, if you don't, think this is worship, you're crazy. They got horns and they got drums. They got horns and drums. And the Bible says that 
when Lucifer was created, he was created with pipes, horns, and tabrets, drums. They are, this is a worship service. Next picture. Get you a little closer. You can get up front, face to face, and see it. Now, show my next picture, Kenny. This is a depiction of Moloch. The reason why I picked it, I don't know if you can blow that up, Kenny, can you? You can do everything else. But I picked this one because the bull, it kind of has a human looking face on it. It's not just a normal run of the mill bull. And I don't know if somebody might be inspired. They might know something. I don't know. That's okay, Kenny. Do I have any more? Okay. So, through with the slideshow. Let's go to Leviticus 18, 21, because this is a Bible study, not a picture show. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed, that's children, so don't let any of your children pass through the fire of Moloch. That's what we just showed you. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Look at uh, Jeremiah 32, 35. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the uh, son of Hinnom. Now right there, you should stop till you figure out what that meant. Because that's an oxymoron. That's like jumbo shrimp. They don't, don't make sense. Pregnant none. They don't, they don't make sense. What? What do you mean? They built the high places in the valley. Why? Why did they build the Tower of Babel in the valley? with a great big mountain on either side. If they were trying to get to heaven, wouldn't it, make smart, wouldn't it be smarter to build it on top of the mountain? They built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire unto Moloch, which I commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Now, I might be totally off, but I got to take you where this verse takes me. Now, I'm not, this is Sherman thinks. Thus thinketh Sherman. When I read this scripture, it, it wants to lead me to something else. Let me show you what I mean. And they built the high places of Baal. Now, um, in the Bible, the, they always talk about the groves. And the groves were always to Baal. And the groves, they always planted certain trees. Uh, they liked uh, pine trees and they like cedar trees. Now, the cedar trees they planted aren't like the little bushes around here. They planted in those groves the trees that, draw, that, that grow the tallest, and those groves were considered holy places, and most of the time they had some kind of spiritual portal thing to go with them. So they would find those places that, that they thought were a place where you could reach the spirit world, right? There's, ask, ask the old Indians, they're all over this place. And they would plant these trees, and that's where they would do their sacrifices and do their rituals. And those groves with those trees stood for the male reproductive organ. That's what the groves were all about. So when you read in the Bible that somebody came in there and cut down the groves, that's what they're doing. They're getting rid of that worship. It's sexual fertility worship. It's the worship of the male organ. And the largest one in the world's in Washington, D.C. Uh, there's another one like it in the Vatican. 
They're called phallic symbols. There's another one like it in Egypt. That's, that's not Washington Monument. Come on, people. you got to wake up. So these high places to Baal, which were in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire and the Moloch. Now, you, you always got to try to understand what this verse is trying to say. So who are they? Well, when you initially read it, you assume that they are the Israelis that built these things so they could sacrifice their sons and daughters. Watch. And they built the high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire under Moloch, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind. Wait a minute that they should do this abomination. What's the abomination? To cause Judah to sin. Well, Judah was the tribe of the Israeli people. When you read it like that, it seems like there's a third party that's causing all this to happen in order to cause Judah to sin. Well, who would be the third party? Now, since I let the cat out of the bag, because I don't have very much time, because I rattle on, let's read it with that thinking. And they built the high places, which are in the valley, to cause their sons and daughters to pass through the fire under Moloch, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my mind, that they should do this to cause Judah to sin. I'm telling you, I think the underlying guilt lies in some evil spirits. God says, I didn't even think about them doing that. Okay, if we don't go anywhere else, we got to solve that. He said, neither it came into my mind. What does that mean? Can you do anything that he doesn't already know? No. Can you derive a plan that, that sucker punches God? No. What is he trying to say here? He's trying to say this is utterly evil. It's terrible. It's the worst of the worst. What he's trying to say is it doesn't get any worse than this. What are you going to do to top this in your sin category? You're killing your own offspring. What is the greatest thing that God has allowed us human beings to do? Make other human beings. And now something came into their mind to kill them in the form of a worship to a bull god. Hmm. Go to Leviticus 20. Let's look here. Leviticus 22. And again, thou shalt say to the children of Israel, whosoever he be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel. Hey, if you keep coming to Sunday school, you're going to learn that when they left Egypt, there's a whole bunch of Egypt Egyptians went with them, and they stayed with them. And all through the Levitical law, God said, those strangers that sojourn, they sojourn. They're on the same journey. They're strangers. They're Gentiles. But when they're sojourning with you or living in your house, they have to abide by the same laws. Watch. Whosoever be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn in Israel that giveth any of his seed, his children, unto Moloch, he shall surely be put to death. The people of the land shall stone him with stones. Look at Ezekiel 23. Ezekiel 23, 37 that they have committed adultery, the blood is in their hand. Now, how do they commit adultery with a false god? Because they've been intimate with a false god. They've worshipped it. They gave their love and attention and affection and even their children. 
God calls it adultery. That they have committed adultery. The blood is in their hands. And with their idols have they committed adultery. And have also caused their sons, whom they bear unto me, to pass for them through the fire to devour them. This is all through the Bible. To a bull god, 38. Moreover, this they have done unto me. They have defiled my sanctuary. Listen to what he says. In the same day and have profaned my Sabbath. For when they had slain their children to their idols, then they came the same day into my sanctuary to profane it. And lo, thus have they done in the midst of mine house. He said in the same day they sacrificed their own children and then they came to church. Go back to verse 39. I want you to see this. Uh, I'm going to make sure I'm in the right place. Might be in 38, Kenny. Well, let's try 37. Oh, here it is. Now, that is, that's why the church ain't very full. Most people can't take this. Watch. They've committed adultery. What's adultery? Anytime you're intimate with somebody you shouldn't be. And so God calls Israel his wife all through the Old Testament. God calls the, uh, the children after the resurrection that are born again his bride. It's the most intimate relationship that you should have. Well, when you're intimate with someone else, that's adultery. When you're married to someone else. They've committed adultery, and blood is in their hands, and with their idols have they committed adultery, and have also caused their sons, whom they bear unto me, to pass them through the fire. The word there is to eat. I'll read it to you again. <laughs> Part of their worship to this bull god was to eat their own children, to devour them. Now, if you just read that, you just keep reading, your mind just thinks devour means to destroy. But devour doesn't mean destroy. Back there in the fellowship hall, Traven and Tiffany brought ten pizzas. And I can assure you, before it gets dark in this land, those pizzas will not be destroyed. They will be devoured. But you can't wrap your brain around it. But once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's all through the Bible. And I, I've got this fear that when I get to heaven, you know, and I get up the nerve to ask God some of my questions, he's going to say, well, you big dummy, you know, it's right here. It's right here. It's right in front of you. So this word here, devour, means exactly what you know it means. And in the Bible, the law says that you should not eat any blood. Now, they threw the babies... Uh, into the furnace. Remember in, in Exodus, uh, one of the plagues was Moses took the ashes out of the furnace in Egypt. And when you just read it in Exodus chapter 10, you don't get it. You don't understand. You got to go here a little bit, there a little bit. And, and Moses took the ashes out of the furnace and he threw them up in the air. And when they came down, everywhere that it hit was boils. But the Bible tells you in other places, the furnace wasn't heating the Pharaoh's house. It was burning human beings, primarily babies, from the Israelites. They put their children in the furnace as a form of worship. So God took that. God made boils come. So I just wanted you to see that before you think I'm crazy. Now, Kenny, if you would, pull up that article 
Now, this is cutting science. Here at Matoka Baptist Church, you're on the cutting edge of science. Watch this. This just out yesterday, I think it was. Chinese scientists may have found vampire secret allowing old mice to live longer using young blood. Ding, 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 that ain't no secret. How many of you ever watched the vampire movie? Yeah, you got to learn. I've, I've taught this to people and they told me, I never even thought about it. The vampire lives off of blood. And the younger, the better. And the younger and the prettier, the better. I guess ugly girls' blood don't have that much energy in them. I don't know. An old, you know, an old lazy old gal probably don't have, you know, I don't know. Go down, if you will, Kenny. you got to go down a little bit. Go on down, and we'll pass through this, and we'll get to the article. There it is. It says... A group of Chinese researchers have discovered a vampire technique involving taking young blood and injecting it into older mice to make them live longer. Go only! That ain't nothing new. That's thousands, that's 6,000 years old. And anybody that's... Go on down. A new study led by researchers from the Chinese Academy of Science found that exposure to old blood could accelerate the aging of various organs and cell types in young mice, and that injecting young blood into old mice could rejuvenate their adult stem cells and surrounding somatic cells. Well, you've got records of that in the book of Jasher, thousands of years old in the uh, Old Testament, thousands of years old in history galore. That's not anything new. This is something I learned last week. I've always heard this stuff about stem cells, but I didn't really know that much about them. But I knew you could take a stem cell from a young person's kidney, let's say, and let's say David J. had bad kidneys. You could inject the stem cells from a young person's kidneys and it would rejuvenate his kidneys and any organ like that. Well, last week I did some study on it, maybe the week before. The stem cells, once they form an organ, are beneficial to that organ in that process I just told you. But if you harvest the stem cells in the umbilical cord, they have yet to be assigned to an organ. And you can put those stem cells into any organ you want, and they'll bring that dead organ to life. There's a big, long name. I had it memorized. I was going to impress you with it. I can't remember it now. So there's a reverse way of using the stem cells, and then there's the, you know. So I just thought that was strange that they're acting like that's some kind of big secret or something. Um, it's been going on forever and ever and ever. So we're going back to the start, Genesis 6. This is talking about angels. Now, let's don't forget what we're talking about. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, we, our theologians, think this is about six generations after Adam. Uh, that daughters were born unto them, so unto human beings, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, so there's a direct difference. The sons of God, which always in every occurrence in the Old Testament are angels, angelic hosts, saw the daughters of men that they were fair. Now remember, we showed you in Genesis 15, 315, that God declared that this fallen cherub had the capability of making offspring. In Genesis 3.15, God said he's going to put a war between the seed of this cherub, Satan, and the seed of this woman. And that war are, is what we call the seed war. 
So the sons of God, which are fallen angels, saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives for all which they chose. Now the word took there in the Hebrew means they took by force. Okay? So they did whatever they wanted. Verse 3. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also that he also is flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. And there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, meaning after the flood, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men. That's what brought the giants. So there were giants in the earth when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them. The same became mighty men which were of old, men of renown. So, this is a subject that we can't shy away from. It unlocks the whole Bible. This ideal, the sons of God, it was not a third of the angels. It was, according to the book of Enoch, it was 200. Now, I used to wonder, how did human women give birth to giants? Because the most famous giant is Goliath. But Goliath is several hundred years the other side of the flood. And there had been inner breeding of humans until Goliath is a, a massive giant, but he's a baby. In the Old Testament uh, account before the flood, it says they were as tall as the cedars of Lebanon. We have bones that uh, the human being, we have female, I don't have, but scientists have found bones if they extrapolate the human from the femur of the tallest, some of the tallest ones, they'd be 36 to 40 feet tall. And that's the bones they found. Anytime bones are discovered, the Smithsonian comes and gets them and then they act like they don't have them. It's been the greatest cover up ever. But a 13 or 15 foot tall Goliath would be an unbelievable thing. But the Bible seems to indicate that some of them could have been 150 feet tall and maybe taller. What does that mean? We're going to show you when the Israelites send in the witnesses to the land of Canaan, they have grapes that are bigger than a bowling ball. They came back and said one cluster of grapes in that land takes two men to carry it on a pole. Well, it just goes to figure if you're a giant, you've got to genetically modify the food. A giant can't live off grapes that big. They had genetically modified the food. One of the things that they come back and testify is those people devour each other. They are cannibals. We'll get it. We'll get to it. So, this, uh, go to Job chapter 1, verse 6 and 7. We're going to nail this down. Who, who are these people? Now, there was a day when the sons of God, here you go, came to present themselves before the Lord. That's the angelic host. They came to the throne of God to present themselves to God, and Satan came also among them. So he's in heaven then. He's in heaven now. The Bible says he accuses the brethren day and night. He's in heaven. He did fall. He lost his place, but he didn't lose his access. He lost his position, but he still has access. Watch. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Notice what he didn't say. He didn't say,
from going on the earth and slithering around like a snake. You know, when I go to earth, I'm a serpent. <laughs> no, he said he'd been walking. He'd been walking up and down in it, just like any other man. He's walking. Look at Job 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind, and he said, Who is this that darketh counsel by words without knowledge? Now, I'll just be honest with you. If you'll read the book of Job, if you'll force yourself to read the whole thing, and you don't feel sorry for Job at the end of it when God gets through with him, you come and see me. I almost say like, oh, God, man, you're being a little rough on the guy, ain't you? And right here, he says, who are you? you trying to tell me something, and you're a big dummy. He said, who, who's trying to give me counsel, darketh counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up now thy loins like a man. For I will demand of thee, and answer thou me. He's in other words, you don't ask me no questions, I'll ask them to you. Where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Declare it. Declare it if you have understanding. Who hath laid the measure thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Fastened? So the foundation of the earth is fastened to something? I thought it was a ball. Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? There's a cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut up the sea with doors when it break forth? as if it had issued out of the womb. Well, he's declaring the sons of God are angels. Look at Hebrews 1, 4 through 8. We're in the book of Hebrews, right? Being made so much better than the angels, and he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they, for under which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now God calls them the sons of God many times. He calls you a son of God many times, but you have to rightly divide it. He calls you women sons of God. So you have to have a little bit of smarts about you. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son? You just read it two times where he called them the sons of God. But notice the qualifier. This day have I begotten thee, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten unto the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. Talking about Jesus. And of the angels, he said, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. But unto the Son, he saith, thy throne, O God. So the Son is God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, the scepter of thy kingdom. So, look at John 3, 14. We're going to figure out before we leave, we've got five minutes, how are we going to figure this out? And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have, ever, uh, have eternal life. So Jesus is going to be lifted up in the personification of evil, which the picture of that is a serpent. You get that? Because in Egypt, they were acting a fool again, so God sent a bunch of servants to bite and kill them. And they cried out to God, and God said, I tell you what, if you'll put a serpent on a pole, anybody that looks at it, then I'll heal them. And he's doing that to set this up for this. Why? Because a serpent 
was a personification of evil. It was a picture of evil. And so the Bible says, go back to 15, if you will, that, go back to 14. Just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up on a pole. 15. That whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So was Jesus a serpent? No, he was the personification of sin. He took on all the sin. It pleased God to make him to be sin. He's the picture of sin. And the picture of sin is a serpent. Verse 16, well, we all know that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. It's already condemned, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So we've got this phrase, the only begotten. So John 1.14, John 1.14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word of God, the essence of God, become flesh. Look at verse 18, four verses down. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So he's the only begotten. Look at 1 John 4, 9. 1 John 4, 9 says, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world that we might live through him. Well, he's the only begotten. Look at 1 John 5, 1. <coughs> Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that beget, loveth him, also that is begotten of him. So if you believe and you're born of God, you are begotten of God. So you are a son of God. You are begotten of God. But the part of you that is born of God is your spirit, not your flesh. That's the difference. How can Jesus be the only begotten son of God? Because he's the only one born in the flesh from the seed of God, his word. You are begotten of God. You are born of God. Yes, you are a son, a daughter of God. But spiritually... Your body was born from your mom and daddy. It's that simple. Look at 1 John 5, 18. 1 John 5, 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Now, don't raise your hands. But how many of you sin today? I mean, do you believe the Bible or don't you? Or are you just somewhat, you know, you say you believe it. Let's see if you do. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Did you sin today? Now, some of you is goody two-shoes. How about this week? Maybe you made it today. Have you sinned this week? Have you eaten too much? Have you eaten too little? Have you slept too much? Have you slept too little? Have you had a thought come in your mind and you've pondered it? You can't get away from it. Well, do you believe the Bible or not? Because the Bible says if you are born of God, you don't sin. Well, there's a part of you that's born of God, and that ain't your flesh. And whatever you've done this week or today or the last ten minutes, some of you probably cussing me because it's hot in here. I know I am. You didn't do that with your spirit. That's why that teaching of the circumcision of the, the soul and spirit cut away from the flesh is so important because you know what? You can't rectify that verse right there, and I dare you take that to any preacher in town and ask them to explain it, and they'll just start fumbling. And they'll give you some cock and bull thing 
that they think will suffice you in your limited knowledge. And I got the truth for it. The part of you that's born of God is your spirit. And it's housed in your soul, which is your spiritual body. And the Bible says God performs that circumcision without hands, the operation of God, where he cuts your sinful flesh away from your soul so that when your flesh sins, it doesn't contaminate your spirit and soul. You've got a part of you that cannot sin. Why? Because it's born of incorruptible seed. It couldn't sin if it wanted to. See, that was the problem that led me to that truth. I always thought, now in the... In eternity, we're still going to have our free will. What's going to keep some uh, knucklehead from starting this whole thing over? It's going to be that you're going to be in a spirit, man, that's from incorruptible seed. It cannot be corrupted. See, you were born in the flesh from corruptible seed. So you couldn't help it. That was your nature. And some of you got on the sinning train quicker than others. All right, so look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 through 5, and we'll be done. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again. He has begotten us again. Out of his mercy he has begotten us again. He has born us again. Well, what? In the spirit. You have been born again in the flesh. He has begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away or doesn't decay reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God, you don't keep nothing. You are kept by the power of God. One of the reasons why I believe in eternal security, uh, one, it's a biblical truth. Two, it's the only way anybody would ever make it. And you're kept by God's power. So it's God's unbelievable plan that he would be able to begotten you again, birth you again in such a way that there's no possible way you could mess it up. So he births your spirit with an incorruptible, undefiled seed, and you're good to go. Now, what you do in your flesh, you're going to reap in your flesh. You can be as born again as anybody, and if you go rob the bank, you're going to go to jail. If you go rob the bank and you're walking out and the cops stop you. Now, I just want to say this. There's a lot of stuff coming out about this shooting in Texas at that school that don't add up. There's one guy who was the police chief over the school officers told all the officers to stand down for an hour. The earliest reports say a teacher let the boy in with the gun. And the earliest reports say a couple of police officers went in after him through the same door. I just said all that to say this. You go downtown and rob a bank, they won't sit outside for an hour. They'll come in and shoot you dead. But they'll sit out there and listen to gunshots in a fourth grade classroom for an hour. Something ain't adding up, people. You say, you got a conspiracy every day. Yeah, you got that right. Psalms 2. You are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So, you're begotten again or you're born again. Once of man's seed, once of God's seed. So the mainline theological teaching 
is called the Sethite theory. They do not believe or teach or promote that fallen angels could come to earth and have sex with women to try to corrupt the bloodline of the human race. And they do not teach it in hardly any seminaries. It's the theological given teaching is the Sethite teaching, and that is that the reference was to the godly line of Seth, the son of Adam and Eve, the godly line of him started having uh, babies with the heathen women. Now, first of all, there was no godly line of Seth. They were as evil as anybody else on the planet. That does not compute. Number two, godly and ungodly people don't make giants. Now, for a long time, I wondered, how could a human woman give birth to these giants? 100 feet tall, 30 feet tall, 15 feet tall. Then as I studied it and studied it and studied it, the giants were birthed, stay with me, just like fish and reptiles. In other words, the giants were born normal size how many we got some professionals in the room how many eggs does a mama fish lay well some of them mama fish may weigh 50 pounds but the egg is little bitty snakes some of them have live births they're little bitty snakes some of them lay eggs giant alligators have little bitty eggs so the giants were born normal size to normal women, but the caps on their DNA weren't there just like on a snake. Just like on a snake or a reptile or a fish, they grow until they die. And that was the truth about the giants. So that answers that question for you. So one, there is no godly line of Seth. And two, godly people and ungodly people, when they have babies, they don't turn into giants. Here's the verse that they use, Matthew 22, and I'm going to be done, I promise. Matthew 22, 23, Jesus talking. The same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. That's why they're sad, you see and ask him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed or children unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third unto the seventh. Well, they, she outlived them all. And last of all, the woman died also. Well, I imagine so. She got tired of digging graves. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage but are as the angels of God in heaven. Notice the key words. In heaven. In heaven, they're not given in marriage. The angels aren't given in marriage in heaven, primarily because they're all males. But we're not talking about in heaven. We're talking about they left their first estate and came down here and when they come down here, they manifest as men. Now, this is the scripture they gave me at Barnesdall, told me to quit teaching this. And I told them, people have babies without being married. And that says in heaven, that doesn't say here on the earth. So I've been studying this a long time. Let me tell you how it works. There's this guy, he was a foremost, he, he was way ahead of his time, named Stephen Quell. So I was at Kolos working out, and these two, these two women were working out down from me, and they were just talking real loud like women do. 
And, and I heard one of them say Nephilim. Well, the scripture you just read in Genesis 6, where that word is giant, is the Hebrew word Nephilim. I don't use it a lot because it creeps people out. I don't know there's some kind of connotation to it, but that's the Hebrew word Nephilim. And they was talking about Nephilim, and they said Stephen Quayle, and I thought, well, who are these chicks? And so I couldn't take it no more, and I said, what do you two know about Nephilim? Well, they weren't afraid of nothing. They looked at me, and they said, well, what do you know? I said, quite a bit. And they said, yeah, right. And that's how I met Michelle Chupacabra. <laughs> and we started a conversation, and I said, yeah. But it's odd. Why has this teaching been kept from people? Because it unlocks the whole Bible. And it's on every page, and we'll show you before we're done. Thank you for coming. You might see if there's any pizza left. I don't know if there is or not. But if there are, go back there and devour it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your precious word. Thank you for these precious people. I'd rather be in your house than camping. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.